I was going to start with a joke, but after Joseph and the Heinlich thing, I said, yeah, I ain't doing that. Uh, so, uh, I don't know. Can you, are you guys good for one more? Yeah. You good for one more? Okay, good. Well, I don't know if you ever go to the doctor. Sometimes I go to the doctor, you know, they get a glove. He gets the glove out and starts putting it on. You're thinking like, uh, hey, is this going to hurt? And, of course, the answer is always the same. It's like, no, but you're going to feel some pressure while he pulls the glove up to his shoulder, right? <clears throat> so I just want to kind of preface this with uh, you might experience a little bit of pressure as we go through this session. So let's pray. Father, we praise you and we thank you for all your many blessings. We thank you that you are better to us than we deserve. We ask that you would speak to us right now. Speak to us in such a way, Father, that we would not be unchanged, but that we would be changed by the power of your word, by the power of your spirit, by the power of your blood, and by the power of your promise. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so the, uh, my topic is walk the walk. And it says, uh, the text that I have, it says, if your sons are careful to walk before my face in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, you will never lack a man to sit on the throne of Israel. This is a powerful text. The first part it says is if your sons are careful. And I want to talk to you about the idea of what are our children going to be careful about? I'm going to give you a hot tip on that, on what they will be careful about. But it says, if they were careful to walk before my face in truth, as opposed to walking behind God's back or in the dark or in the shadow in sin, obviously that's not what we want for our sons and daughters. Not that they should walk in darkness, but that they should walk before God's face in truth. And it says, with all their heart. And the word in Hebrew, therefore, heart is lev. And it means the hidden parts, what we would call the personality. It means our children. It's their intellect. It is their emotional person. And it is their volition. Are they strong-willed, weak-willed? What we would call their personality. It said, if they will walk before me with all their heart and with all their soul. And the word there is nafesh. And the nafesh means the idea of all of the life force that God has placed in them all of the giftings, all of the talents, all of the abilities, and all of the life. And so the idea here is, if your sons will be careful to walk before my face in truth with all of their personality and with all that God has placed in them, you will never lack leadership in the kingdom of God. And of course, that is our heart's desire, right? Because when we consider the future for our children or for our grandchildren, I think that we would be uh, uh, in agreement it wouldn't matter if my son became a billionaire and got uh, a Nobel Peace Prize and got the Emmys and the Oscar and everything else and then went to hell. I mean, who cares? Uh, but if my son would be one who goes out and is trying to reach the lost for the Lord and to build the kingdom of God, I don't care if he lives in a van under a bridge because there is a kingdom that lasts and there's a kingdom that evaporates. And so what we are wanting is that our sons and that our daughters would grow up to be leaders in the kingdom of God, that there would be no lack of leadership in the kingdom of God. And so what I want to talk to you about is how do we do this? How do we go from one generation to the next generation that they may walk the walk? And I'm going to give you three things. I'm going to give you the key to doing this. I'm going to give you the method for doing this. And then I'm going to give you some very practicals on how to do this. So you guys ready? First, the key. Anytime we're looking for a key to anything, we look to the, who, the one who is the key. Uh, the key to the door. We, we look to Christ. And obviously, Jesus called us to believe in him. It says, you believe in God, believe also in me. It says, but as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Obviously, we're called to believe that that's the promise of salvation, that we might be converted from hell bound into the kingdom of heaven and a convert. But that is not the end of it. And unfortunately, I think in a lot of the evangelical church, that's kind of the, that's kind of the goal, and then we, and we stop. And, and that's not what Jesus did. Yes, Jesus said to believe in him, but what did he say more? He said, follow me, follow me. He says, I am the vine and you are the branch. He who abides in me. There is, the idea is he did not say, go therefore and make converts of all nations, did he? He said, make disciples. Disciple is completely different 
because what we're doing is we're complete, we're, we are aligning not just our belief system, not just that somehow we intellectually believe in this idea, but that it is, there's an integrity in who we are. That in my mind and in my body and in my spirit and in my soul, I am one individual who ha has an integrity of belief. I don't just have orthopraxy. I don't just believe correctly. I, have, I mean, I don't just have orthodoxy. I don't just believe correctly. I have orthopraxy. I live correctly. There's an integrated idea here. God is calling us to make disciples. And so in that, the key for Jesus making disciples was to be with him. So the key for us making disciples of Christ is this. Be a good thing to write down. You must be the man you want your sons to become and your daughters to marry. Did you catch that? You must be the man. You must be the man that you want your sons to become. You must be the man that you want your daughters to marry because that's what's going to happen. Babies, children, they love their mamas. They will always love their mamas. Boys love their mamas. Girls love their mamas. But they follow their dads. They look to their dads for leadership. It says, and when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. It didn't say you have the opportunity to be my witnesses. You might be my witnesses. It's like, no, if you're saved, you're my witness. You're a good witness, you're a bad witness, but you're a witness. And the truth is, is that there is no place that we are more of a witness than within our homes and within our families and amongst those that we know. You can fake it with me, I can fake it with you. A lot of, you know, hey, kumbaya, brother, right? We can, we can say all of the nice stuff here, but the truth is anybody who truly knows you knows the truth. Anybody who truly knows me knows the truth. So the key is we must be the men we want our sons to become and our daughters to marry. Now, you might say, well, my children are grown. You're not off the hook. You must be the man you want your grandsons to become and your granddaughters to marry. He said, well, I don't have any kids. All right. <laughs> you must be the man that you want the men around you to be and the women around you to marry. You know, it always gets me, uh, I've, I've, so many times, um, I, I didn't have any daughters. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, but, because uh, it would be tough, right? But I've known men who've had daughters, and they've said stuff like, man, I don't get it. I don't know what she's doing with this, with this doofus, right? And I'm thinking, uh, he only had to outlove you. I mean, if you're, if you're upset at the level of caliber that your daughter's falling for, look in the mirror because the young man only has to outdo you. We have to take on the responsibility for our children and our grandchildren and everybody who is around us. We cannot shirk that responsibility. We cannot abdicate that responsibility. That authority has been placed upon us when we were born with a Y chromosome. We are the men and we don't get a pass. We will live this life, and then we will stand before our maker. So we should be alert, don't you think? All right, so the key is that you must be the man that you want your sons to become. That's the key. What's the method? The method is that if we, we go back again and look at Jesus, and what Jesus did is Jesus established a community of believers within his community. So think about the time when Jesus is doing this. Jesus is bringing his disciples, he's bringing his apostles, he's bringing the followers, and they're living with him. They're spending time with him. He's made a, a community in miniature in what type of a world? In a world where religious corruption was absolutely rampant, right? In a world where um, political oppression and political persecution was extreme. Now, right now, we're all kind of, uh, you know, just in conversations, we're all kind of going like, what is going on? Because we look at the state of the church and, and, and we might be discouraged because of what we've seen certain pastors do and doors closing and it's like, what are you, what are you doing? And of course, we're all kind of sitting here puzzling like what happened to our constitution? What's going on with our government? And we've got tyranny. 
And it can be discouraging, but I want you to think about it. It doesn't really hold a candle to the conditions in the first century. I think we can get there real quick. But as it stands right now, I think, I think times were more dire when Jesus started. And what did Jesus do? Jesus didn't look around and go like, oh, man, what am I going to do? Jesus said, let's start now. I'm going to make you change the world. Jesus started a transformation for the planet, and he did it through a spiritual community. And by spiritual community, I mean a people who were motivated completely and entirely because they were with Jesus. So I want, you to, I want to give you an idea of what that looks like. It means that, uh, I don't know if you know this, but when, when in, in that time when you would wake up, you would say, you would say the modeane. It's, it's a Hebraic prayer. And the Hebraic prayer is the very first thing you did when you got up. You didn't moan. You didn't groan. You didn't say the first words to break from your lips were to, to, to be this prayer, the Modeani, and the Modeani went like this. I thank you, my living and eternal king, for you have returned my soul to me mercifully. Great is thy faithfulness. That was the prayer. That's a good way to start your morning, isn't it? I thank you. I give thanks to you, my living and eternal king, for you have restored my soul unto me with great mercy. Great is your faithfulness. Not only that, they had all of the blessings, right? It, as they lived, their faith was integrated into every aspect of their life. They would say, So before you would take a drink, you would say, Blessed are you, O Lord God, King of the universe, who has brought forth the fruit from the vine, and they would take a drink. Or before they would eat, they would say, Blessed are you, O Lord God, King of the universe, who has bring forth bread from the earth. Or they had the blessing for all of the commands. Blessed are you, O Lord God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by the commandments and has commanded us to whatever it was. And they knew their Bibles, and so that their actions and their words and their relationships were being directed by the word of God. You see, there wasn't a separation there. And what happened with that? Jesus left the planet in the hands of 11 apostles, about 100 disciples and followers, and the world was changed. Why? Because of faith community. And if we look back through history, this is done again and again and again. When we see the world change, how does it change? It changes through Christian community. Christian church. You see, how did Europe get evangelized? It got evangelized through the Celtic missionary mu movement. When St. Patrick turned all of these Irish pagans into Christians, they immediately, not did they just get saved, they became disciples, and what did they do? They went and they flooded Europe to go after all these other nomadic weird tribes of Europeans, people who ran around naked in the forest, painting themselves blue and worshiping trees, Right? And they would go and set up a Christian community within that community to show them how life is done in the kingdom of God. Now, of course, they didn't pray the prayers of the Hebrews. They prayed the great Celtic prayers, right? I arise today in the mighty strength of the Trinity and a belief in the threeness and a confession of the oneness of the creator of creation. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ within me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ to my right hand and Christ to my left. Christ when I rise up, Christ when I walk by the way, Christ when I lie down. Christ in the minds of all who think of me, Christ on the lips of all who speak of me, Christ in the eyes of all who see me, Christ in the ears of all who hear me. I arise today in a mighty invocation of the Trinity, in a belief in the threeness, in a confession of the oneness of the creator of creation. That's a way to wake up in the morning. Much better than, oh, crud, <laughs> right? How are you waking up? They woke up on purpose. And then the Celts, they had all these crazy prayers and, and, and songs. They literally, they literally had the, the song of turning the butter, butter. They would have the prayers of kneading the bread. They had prayers and songs of how they plied their trades. Every aspect of their life was based upon their identity in Jesus Christ. There was not a separation of church and state in their life. There was not a separation of the sacred and the secular. Everything they did was an act of worship. Because they understood that everything we do is an act of worship. 
we have a tendency to compartmentalize our life and say, well, this is my faith life, and then this is my career life, and this is my family life, and this is my entertainment life, and this is my hobby, and that, and, and that is a wrong idea. That is a secular pagan idea. That is not a biblical idea. According to my Bible, everything I am is Jesus. My entertainment choices are part of my worship. The food I eat, the things I do, the way I conduct myself at work, the way I speak to my wife, this is my worship. There is no separation. There must be an integrity because we all know, and we've probably all been at one point or other, someone who confessed one thing and lived something else. We call that a hypocrite. And that kept a lot of us away from the church for a very long time when we see Christian hypocrisy. Because the truth is, that's an oxymoron. There should be no Christian hypocrisy. There should only be Christian integrity. There should be this idea that everything I am is my worship. So what did they do? The Celts evangelized Europe. It wasn't the Latins. It was the Celts because they created Christian community and another community. The very foundations of our nation. What was it? It was a bunch of faith communities that were fleeing persecution in their home countries, right? It was pilgrims and Puritans and Quakers and Baptists and Catholics uh, and Episcopals, and they were fleeing persecution to come over here and establish Christian communities called colonies where they would, what would they do? They would build a church in the town square and then they would build their community around the church. The church was the center of the town. The church bell was the communication, it was the internet of, of the town, right? Everything was built around the idea of who they were as a Christian community. And they built that upon the Magna Carta and on, on the uh, Mayflower Compact, which ended up becoming state charters, which ended up becoming the charter for our very nation, right? Our constitution is based upon scripture. And so, of course, they didn't pray the, 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 uh, the Hebraic prayers. They didn't pray the Celtic prayers. They had the great Puritan prayers. They would say stuff like, Almighty God, as I cross the threshold into this day, I commit myself, soul, body, affairs, and friends under your care. Incline my heart to your ways. Mold me wholly into the image of Jesus as a potter forms the clay. Let those around me see me living by your spirit, trampling underfoot the world and clad in the armor of God. Do you see, do you, are you seeing a pattern here? People who are being directed from the very first time they open their eyes throughout the course of all of their life, recognizing I am here for one purpose and one purpose only. I am here to glorify God. I am here to worship. I am here to make disciples. This is uh, something that has been recognized uh, as far as our country is concerned um, by great theologians. Os Guinness, who's a British theologian, wrote a book, A Free People's Suicide, and he recognized that this was the pattern that the country was built upon. And if you go back and if you look at the writings of all the founders, I mean, it is like almost all of them, you'll see this pattern. What they all said is that it is a faith people, it is a spiritual community that produces a virtuous community. In other words, when you believe right, you behave right. A religious community becomes a moral community. And when you have people who believe right and they behave right, then they are capable of being a free people. So faith produces virtue virtue produces freedom for those whom the lord sets free are free indeed and then that freedom draws those who are in bondage draws those who are in the shackles of sin it is an attractive beautiful thing that draws the lost where back to becoming part of a faith people so we believe right then we behave right and then we are free and then other people are like who are you it's like come on in let me show you come with me to my faith community Come with me and meet my brothers and sisters, and you're going to meet a people like you've never met before. We gather together and sing. We gather together and study the truth. We gather together and we minister to each other. We gather together and we change our community. Why? Because we're of a different kingdom. We are not of this world. 
we are of the kingdom of God. And that is something that we don't just say, we live and we exhibit within our life. Does that make sense? So the key is that you must become the man that you want your sons to become and your daughters to marry. And the method is that you have got to build around you and you must be become part of a spiritual community. Now I'd like to get into the practicals. And to do this, I'm going to go back to Sir Alfred Lord Tennyson. He wrote a, an amazing epic poem called The Idols of the King. It was the tales of King Arthur. And within that epic poem, there is a subsection called the, the, the story of Gareth and Lynette. He's known as the Kitchen Knight. And so Gareth was the youngest son of King Lot. He was the tallest, but he was the youngest. His older brothers had already gone to go and serve King Arthur. In fact, his oldest brother, Sir Gawain, was already one of Arthur's closest knights. Now, his father, King Lot, had actually fought against Arthur, and so now King Lot is just kind of a, a shell of a man. He's blind, and he's mute, and he doesn't do anything, and he just sits there. And so Gareth's mother, um, Bellicent, she's trying to convince Gareth to stay at home because basically her husband is a shell. Her boys are off working with, with, with King Arthur. And so she turns to Gareth and she says, son, stay here. We have castles. We have lands. Prove your manhood by following the deer. Be a hunter and I will find you a beautiful maiden to be your wife. She was essentially turning and trying to appeal to her son. Look, you can be like Gaston from Beauty and the Beast, right? You can decorate with antlers. You can have a big hairy chest. You can go be a hunter. You can be Esau. You can be a man's man. And Gareth responds like this. Follow the deer. Follow Christ the king. Live pure, speak truth, right wrong, and follow the king, else wherefore born. Son, that's awesome. Follow the deer. Follow the world. Are, are you crazy? Follow Christ, live pure, speak truth, right wrong, and follow the king. That's why I was born. And, and, that, and obviously, I robbed from that for the back of this, the little badge, right? But I want to show you that that's an amazing pattern. These are the practicals. Live pure. To live pure, you have to slay your dragons, your demons, but these dragons lurk about in the shadows of our heart and we must kill them. Jesus said, be ye holy as I am holy. He says that you must, in fact, one of the ways that it talks about to live, the metaphor that's used for living in the Bible often is to walk, right? And so Paul exhorts, he says, therefore I, a prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling of which you've been called. In Colossians, he says, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. In Thessalonians, he says, walk in a manner worthy of the God who called you unto his kingdom and glory. We are to walk in a manner that is worthy, which means we have to get brutal with our sin. And I want to propose to you that there are four areas. This is a little bit redundant because we've been hearing this today, but I'm, I'm, I'm not saying this. I don't want you to listen to what I'm about to say in some kind of like, detached arena. I'm going to name four areas of your life and I'm going to start calling out specific sins in those four caves, if you will. There's dragons and there's four caves inside of you. And I want you to literally identify and write down any of these dragons that are in your life. Does that make sense? The first cave is the cave of lust and appetite. These are the sins of pornography, of fornication, of adultery, of sexual perversion. These are the sins of gluttony, of drunkenness, of drug abuse. These are the sins of appetite. Does that make sense? And you need to write down right now in your book, who cares who reads it? Because you're going to kill these dragons. Are any of these things in your life? You need to mark them down. You need to be brutally honest with yourself. Do not make it a cute little, don't color it as like a cute little pink dragon. It's not a cute little pink dragon. Your sin is vile and damnable. And it will rob you and it will rob your children and it will rob your wife and it will rob anybody who cares about you. Write them down. I'm going to show you how to get brutal with them. 
That's the first cave. The second cave is avarice or it's of greed. It's of materialism. These are the sins of cutting corners to make more profit, of cheating on your taxes. These are the sins of striving more for having a nice truck or a nice big screen TV or a four-wheeler or something like that or better boots. Remember, it said, if your children are careful to walk before me in truth. Do you remember that? What are they careful with? I'll tell you what, whatever you're careful with. What's going to be important to your children? What's important to you? And if, and if your truck is the most important thing to you, then it's going to be the most important thing to your kids. They're going to live and die for what you are living and dying for. And so you might say Jesus all the time, but if your life is showing that there is a different set of priorities in your life, then that is going to be the priorities that you are literally passing on to your children. Does that make sense? And so the, the idea of the dragons of, of greed, it's like, is there, is there a materialistic motivation in your life? Are, are you knocking yourself? Are you spending time to get more stuff? Why? It's just going to rust. The idea is we've got to think about what is truly valuable on, the, on, the, on a scale of things. Truck might be nice, but it has nothing to do like with my kids. So like I, I, uh, a, a lot of times I'm trying to talk to people because it's like you've got to get your kids out of public ed. You've got to get them into our school. I can't afford it, which is a lie. And I'm like, listen, if you give, bring your kid in in kindergarten and you pay full tuition from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade, I've added it all up. You can buy a nice Ford Laredo truck. That's a nice truck. But who's going to finance you for 13 years to buy a truck? Nobody. And if they did, if you found somebody to finance you for 13 years to buy the truck, what would you have at the end of 13 years? No beat up old truck. But what if you spent that on your son or on your daughter? Do you see the difference? And see, that's the thing is I have people who drive in in really nice new cars and then walk in and tell me that they can't afford to, to raise their child in the truth. And I'm looking at them and trying to be polite but wanting to say, you are so jacked up. This is your son and your daughter. If you have to eat beans and ride a bicycle, then you should eat beans and ride a bicycle and shop at, at Savers, but make sure that your sons and daughters have what they need, right? All right, so there's this idea. Are there any demons are there any dragons of greed in your life? What's the third cave? The third cave is anger and unforgiveness. And the idea of anger and unforgiveness, is there anybody on the planet that you have not forgiven? Is there anybody on the planet that changes your blood pressure? If you were standing with me, in fact, I had a pastor say this one to me, and I, and I remembered it. He says, I, I always have to do an inventory that when I'm standing at the pulpit, that there is nobody on planet Earth that if they walked through that back door, they would stop my mouth. That there's nobody who could walk through that door who would stop my praise. There's nobody who would walk through that door that would make me drop my head. Are you with me? We have to get and we have to forgive everyone. Remember, Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And of course, we translate it, Forgive us our debts, our trespasses. Debts, trespasses, my hiney. My sin. Forgive me my sin as I forgive others who sin against me. And whenever you tell somebody, hey, I think there's some unforgiveness in your life. I think you need to forgive this person. They go, do you know what they did to me? They sinned against me. That's why you got to forgive them. If they just annoyed you, I'd say, get over it. The only people you have to forgive are those who sin against you. And what Jesus, to make sure that we got it, as soon as he ended the prayer, he says, because if you do not forgive those who sin against you, your father won't forgive you. And of course, we don't, we don't cross-stitch that on a pillow, do we? You don't have that posted up in your bed, right? On your desk at work, you don't have that there. But Jesus made that very clear, didn't he? He wanted to let us know forgiveness is not a door or an option or a switch. Forgiveness is a body of water. 
You cannot receive it unless you're giving it. You have to jump into forgiveness. There's no keeping your foot on the shore. If you want to be washed in forgiveness, you have to jump in, which means that you have to give forgiveness. It's not a pipe. It is an ocean. And so we have, you have to look through. Is there, do you have any resentment, unforgiveness, bitterness, or hatred in your life? Because I don't care who it is. It can be somebody completely different than you. It can be a Taliban member. It can be a homosexual Taliban member. It can be a homosexual Taliban member who's a different color skin than you. They're created in the image of Jesus Christ. And he bled and died for them. So who are we to say that we will not forgive them? Does that make sense? So you have to search your heart. Is there any unforgiveness in your life? It cannot be there. And the last cave... The last cave is the most pernicious. The last one is the idea of pride and self-righteousness. What are the demons of pride and self-righteousness? The demons of pride and self-righteousness are the idea that I'm a good person. The idea that, well, you know, well, I'm Calvary. Can we be prideful that we're Calvary? At least we're not like those other cereal churches, you know, the fruits, nuts, and flakes, Right? And we somehow we, we get some kind of sense of superiority. I want you to remember back to the time of Christ in the Bible. When he was with prostitutes, sinners, lepers, really bad guys, thieves, he was pretty chill. When did, when did it seem like his, his angst got up? It was with self-righteous people, wasn't it? That's when he got upset. And so we cannot give any quarter to the idea of self-righteousness in our life. Now, I want to tell you, you've got to be merciless with this, and let me give you a little bit of an idea on what that means. Um, when I was a young man, I was a consultant, which means I got to fly around on jets to go to different towns, and when I was there, the client was paying for everything, so I drove really fancy rental cars, and I stayed in the nicest hotels, and I had lots of money to eat whatever I wanted to eat. I could have steak every night, and when you're in that situation as a consultant where you're just kind of flying in, and, and you get all that nice stuff, it has a tendency to draw broken women, and I was being approached by women, and this was a temptation because I was a young man. Now, I shared an office with a dear brother, a Christian brother. His name was Walt, and he was also a consultant, and he was flying around. And, and basically, we were sitting in the office one day, and we just kind of confided in each other. It's like, dude, I, I got women approaching me. And he goes, yeah, me too. So we decided, to, we, we decided to, what we were going to do. And so this was our agreement. When I got back from a trip, Walt would come up, and he would grab me by my collar, and he would say, look me in the eyes, and you tell me, did you protect Dorothy? Did you protect your sons? And he says, look me in the eyes so he could tell if I was lying. And the same thing, if he came out off of a trip, I would go up and I would grab him by the collar, and, I would look, and I'd say, look me in the eyes. Did you protect Jenny? Did you protect your daughters? And then we prayed that the Holy Spirit would give us revelation if the other person was lying and that they would get busted. So we called the Spirit to come into this agreement. Are you with me? Then the second part of the covenant was if we found that the other person did not protect their family, it was our job to beat the crap out of the other person. <laughs> it's like, if I don't, you beat me. You beat me until I need a dentist and stitches. And then you tell my wife and you tell my pastor. And, then, and if I find that you did not protect your wife and your daughters, I'm going to beat you until I can't beat you anymore. And then I'm going to tell your wife and I'm going to tell your pastor and I'm going to wreck your life. And we're like, agreed. <laughs> and it worked beautifully. <laughs> because you see, we're men. If we would have said, well, what happens if it doesn't work? Oh, well, we'll just sit down and we'll have a cup of coffee. We'll talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> So the next time I'm on the road, some girl comes up. I'm like, yeah, whatever. Is it a temptation? Nope. You, you represent the end of my life, my marriage, my family, my ministry, and everything that I've worked on up to this point. You are not that hot. <laughs> so we have to be merciless with these dragons. Does that make sense? 
don't come up with some wussy plan to get rid of these dragons. If you've got a sin, you've got to be brutal. We're men, right? Does that make sense? All right, so be really brutal. That's live pure, speak truth. You've got to speak truth. To speak truth, you've got to know truth. You've got to know your Bible. We've been called in the scriptures, therefore laying aside falsehood, speak truth with each one. In 2 Timothy, it says, it says that be diligent to present yourself approved as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, handling accurate the word of truth. The Bible says, how can a man, young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to thy word, thy word I have treasured in my heart that I won't sin against thee. The key to all of this is we've got to have Bible in us. I had a pastor who said you need to palm your Bible. You know, we all know what it means to palm a basketball. But you need to palm your Bible, which means you know Genesis through Revelation. Not just that you can name all 66 books, but you know what's in all 66 books. And if you can't say that you, you know that right now, then you need to repent right now. And you need to make a determination that you're getting through your Bible this year. Now, some of you might say, well, I'm not a very good reader. Then I want you to write down D-A-B, DAB, Daily Audio Bible. This guy's been, since 2006, has been reading through a Bible through the year program. A little bit of the Old Testament, a little bit of the New Testament, a little bit of Psalms and Proverbs. He's a little fruity, okay? He's kind of an artsy guy. His name's Brian, right? So he reads, he's got a great reading voice. He reads through the whole thing. But at the end, he says a prayer, and then he says, I'm Brian, and I love you. That's a little weird. But he gets through the Bible, <laughs> right? And about 20 minutes a day. And then it goes on for about another 10 minutes where people from all over the planet are going in and praying for each other. And if you want to listen to that, that's fine. I won't judge you. But really, the point is get through the first 20 minutes. So if you have a commute that gets you 10 minutes to go and 10 minutes to come back, then there's absolutely no excuse that you don't get through your Bible cover to cover this year. There's no reason. And the thing is, is once you've done that once, then you do it again. And then you do it again. And then you do it again until you quit breathing. But the truth is that we are people of the book. And so there, it needs to be that there's so much Bible in you that it comes out of you, even when you're not planning on it coming out of you. Because it, is, it, it says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. How are you going to do that? You've got to have the word in you. So live pure, slay your dragons, speak truth, know your Bibles, right wrong. To love good, we must hate evil. And this is one place where I think we've become really pathetic. We've been, we've, we've been convinced that we're supposed to be nice. We are supposed to confront evil. We have not called been to be nice, but to be loving. It, to be nice means that I'm going to treat you well so that you treat me well. To be loving is I don't care what you think about me. I'm going to tell you what you need most. You're more important than me. Does that make sense? And so to, we need to stand up against evil. And the reason that we don't do this a lot of times is we're worried we're going to offend somebody. I'm sorry, speaking truth always offends the wicked. Do you not remember? Do you not remember before Jesus when somebody would speak truth to you and it would offend you? And it would offend you and it would offend you and it would offend you until one day the Holy Spirit moved upon your heart and instead it convicted you and you got saved. You see, the way that the, wit, the lost get saved is that truth gets told to them. If we speak the truth and if we stand up against evil, the wicked will be angry, but the righteous will be encouraged to become bold as lions. And we have been called to do that. I'm not making this up. This is in our Bibles, right? Romans 12, 2, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. In Ephesians 6, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, against the rulers of the powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of authority in the, in the heavenly places. But we, and so we must put on the full armor of God, right? In Romans 12, 9, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. And Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and violent men take it by force. 
We must stand up against evil. That means we stand up against lies. We stand up against fornication. We stand up against abortion. We stand up against homosexuality. We stand up against Marxism. We stand up against the indoctrination of our children in public schools. We stand up against medical fascism. We stand up against the destruction of biblical marriage. We stand up against political corruption. We stand up against feminism. We stand up against racism. We stand up against divorce. We stand up against pornography. We stand up against transgenderism. We stand up against anything that sets itself up opposed to the, the ways of God. And guess what? That's going to make a lot of people really angry. But we speak the truth in love. And you say, well, have you? I've talked to all of these categories of people. And to be honest with you, I was most of these categories of people. But somebody spoke truth to me and it changed me. We don't speak it to them condemningly. We speak them truth, and then we know enough about it that we can defend it. Does that make sense? Last, follow the king. We must be intimately pursuing a relationship with Jesus Christ. Remember, there was a book by Sheldon, and then they made the bracelet. What would Jesus do? That's a really dumb question. It's extremely presumptuous. Well, what would Jesus do? Like our little black tarry heart could figure that out. That's a bad question. Don't ever ask that question. Instead, why don't you ask an objective question? What did Jesus do? We study what Jesus did, and then we do what he did. Does that make sense? We don't wonder. I guess Jesus would, no. What did Jesus do? When I get in my Bible, I see that Jesus met the needs around him. He confronted the evil around him, and he spoke the truth in love. And that's what we should be doing. And the only way to do that is that we've got to get Jesus inside of us. We've got to have an intimate relationship with him. And so, remember, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works I do, he will also do, and greater works than these, because I go to the Father. And so the idea here, guys, is the key to transforming others' lives is that we have to be the person that we want our sons, and our our sons to become and our daughters to marry. The method is we become part of a Christian community. A Christian community where there is an integrity with what we believe and how we live. And that everything we do is in accordance with what we believe. We are a transformed people. We, are a, we have been arised from the dead. We are new creatures in Christ. And then the practicals of that is that we live pure, which means we slay our dragons and our demons. We slay the sins that are in us. Because if we do not remove the log from our eye, how are we going to help anybody else with the, the speck that's in theirs? then we must speak truth, which means we must know truth. And we speak it, and we speak it all the time. And if you're not speaking Bible, if you're speaking, um, I don't know, media quotes, then then you're studying the wrong thing. And then we must confront evil. And then ultimately, we must follow Jesus wherever he sends us. Does it? Is, that's the practicals. Does, it, does, does that help kind of pull this together? Are you guys tracking? The idea here is that to, to get other people saved, we got to be saved. This is what Christianity is. Anything short of that is fake Christianity. It's plastic Christianity. We, we've come up with some American subverted version, some pathetic little paper mache um, model. Christianity, my God, my God is not weak. My God is, does not compromise. My God is not apathetic. Is yours? My God's passionate. My God bleeds for me. My God loves me. My God sweat for me. My God came for me. My God raised me. And my God sent me and he called me and he commands me. And, and, and he's so much bigger than me that I would be a fool to ignore him. But that means I must continuously repent. And I must continuously figure out, Jesus, how can I walk closer with you? We have to be more diligent about this than anything else in our life. I'm sure you guys are accomplished in whatever, in something. Maybe you're accomplished in your careers. You're accomplished in your path. You, are, you have some level or status or title or a degree. That's cute. But that's not why you're here. You are not here to follow the deer. You're here to follow Christ the King. And that's what you must master most. Does that make sense? Praise the Lord. 
Father, we just come before you right now, and Lord, we ask that we might dwell in your house. God, we pray that you would help us to abide in your presence, that we would love what you love and we would hate what you hate. Lord, that we would hear what you speak and that we would see what you reveal. God, we pray that you would guide us, that we would walk where you lead, we would serve where you call, that your word would fill our minds, that your love would fill our hearts, that your blood would wash our sin, that your spirit would transform us from the inside out, Lord. We pray that you would do those things in us, but not for us, but that the world may know that you alone are God. Lord, we pray that you would start a fire inside of us that the world cannot ignore. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.